BASED ON LUKE CHAPTER 2, VERSE 14, WHERE IT SAYS, GLORY TO GOD IN THE HIGHEST AND ON EARTH, PEACE, GOOD WILL TOWARDS MEN. NOT PEACE AMONG MEN, BUT PEACE FROM GOD TOWARDS MEN. THE WAR IS OVER. AND THE REASON THAT GOD WAS ABLE TO DECLARE AN ARMISTICE, PEACE BETWEEN GOD AND MAN, IS BECAUSE HE PUT ALL OF HIS WRATH, ALL OF HIS PUNISHMENT FOR OUR SIN UPON JESUS. AND I'VE SPENT TWO WEEKS BEFORE THIS WEEK TALKING ABOUT THE OLD COVENANT AND THE NEW COVENANT, THE DIFFERENCE BETWEEN IT. THIS WEEK I'VE PRIMARILY BEEN FOCUSED ON HEBREWS CHAPTER 9 WHERE IT CONTRASTS THE WAY THAT PEOPLE DEALT WITH SIN UNDER THE OLD COVENANT WITH THE WAY IT'S DEALT WITH UNDER THE NEW COVENANT. IN THE OLD COVENANT, THEY HAD TO OFFER ANIMAL SACRIFICES AND THERE WAS CONSTANT SHEDDING OF BLOOD. EVERY NEW MOON, EVERY SABBATH DAY, THERE WAS A MORNING AND AN EVENING SACRIFICE. THERE WERE SACRIFICES EVERY TIME A PERSON HAD A INDIVIDUAL SIN AND THEN THERE WAS A DAY OF ATONEMENT WHERE THEY OFFERED THE SINS FOR ALL OF THE WHOLE SINS OF THE ENTIRE NATION, EVERYTHING THAT PEOPLE HADN'T COVERED. THERE WAS JUST CONSTANT SHEDDING OF BLOOD. AT THE DEDICATION OF THE TEMPLE, SOLOMON OFFERED, I THINK IT WAS 22,000 uh, OXEN AS SACRIFICES AND 122,000 SHEEP THAT HE OFFERED. IT WAS JUST UNBELIEVABLE, THE AMOUNT OF SACRIFICES. AND THAT'S BECAUSE AN ANIMAL COULD NEVER ATONE FOR SIN. IT WAS ONLY SYMBOLIC. BUT WHEN JESUS CAME, HIS ONE OFFERING FOREVER DEALT WITH SIN. AND THIS IS THE POINT THAT'S BEING MADE IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 9. IT'S CONTRASTING THE OLD COVENANT WHERE THERE WAS JUST ALL OF THESE THOUSANDS AND THOUSANDS OVER THE uh, ENTIRE SPACE OF THE OLD COVENANT, MILLIONS OF ANIMALS THAT WERE SACRIFICED in, IN SYMBOLISM FOR SIN. BUT WHEN JESUS CAME, JESUS WAS THE PERFECT SACRIFICE AND HIS ONE OFFERING DEALT WITH SIN FOREVER. AND THIS IS SOMETHING THAT THE AVERAGE CHRISTIAN HAS NOT FULLY APPRECIATED AND TAKEN ADVANTAGE OF IN THE NEW TESTAMENT. THEY BELIEVE THAT JESUS FORGAVE THEM TO A DEGREE. IF THEY DIED, uh, THEY WOULD GO TO HEAVEN, BUT THEY STILL CAN'T EXPERIENCE TOTAL FREEDOM AND LIBERTY FROM SIN HERE IN THIS LIFE. THE AVERAGE CHRISTIAN GOES THROUGH LIFE, LIMPING THROUGH LIFE WITH A SIN CONSCIOUSNESS, A SHAME, a, a UNWORTHINESS CONSCIOUSNESS, AND THEY STILL FEEL LIKE THAT uh, GOD ISN'T ANSWERING THEIR PRAYERS BECAUSE THEY'VE FALLEN SHORT IN SOME WAY. I'VE HAD PEOPLE COME TO ME BEFORE AND THEY START TELLING ME THAT, YOU KNOW, I'VE GONE TO CHURCH, I PAY MY tithes, I FAST, I DO ALL THESE THINGS. WHY HASN'T GOD HEALED ME? WHAT THAT'S SAYING IS YOU BELIEVE THAT GOD IS DEALING WITH YOU BASED ON YOUR PERFORMANCE. AND PEOPLE WHO BELIEVE THAT VERY, VERY SELDOM FEEL LIKE THAT THEIR PERFORMANCE WARRANTS THEM EARNING THE BLESSING OF GOD. AND SO THEY MAY NOT DOUBT THAT GOD HAS THE POWER TO MOVE IN THEIR LIFE. THEY JUST DOUBT THAT HE WILL USE HIS POWER BECAUSE THEY FEEL UNWORTHY. YOU KNOW, IF YOU'RE LISTENING, I JUST DESCRIBED A VAST MAJORITY OF THE NUMBER OF PEOPLE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM. YOU DON'T DOUBT THAT GOD HAS THE ABILITY. YOU JUST DOUBT HIS WILLINGNESS TO USE HIS ABILITY BECAUSE YOU FEEL UNWORTHY. MAN, HEBREWS CHAPTER 9 IS SHOWING THAT UNDER THE OLD COVENANT, THESE ANIMAL SACRIFICES WERE ONLY TYPES AND SHADOWS. BUT LET ME READ THIS VERSE AGAIN. I READ THIS YESTERDAY. HEBREWS CHAPTER 9, VERSE 12, NEITHER BY THE BLOOD OF GOATS AND CALVES, BUT BY HIS OWN BLOOD HE ENTERED IN ONCE INTO THE HOLY PLACE, HAVING OBTAINED ETERNAL REDEMPTION FOR US. YOU KNOW, THIS IS ONE OF THE MOST RADICAL THINGS THAT I HAVE EVER TAUGHT. MATTER OF FACT, WHEN I FIRST STARTED TEACHING THIS BASED ON HEBREWS CHAPTER 9 AND CHAPTER 10, I HAD NEVER HEARD ANOTHER PERSON EVER SAY THIS. AND I CALLED A NUMBER OF MY FRIENDS SAYING, WHAT DO YOU THINK ABOUT THIS? AND THEY ALL THOUGHT, Boy, MAN, THAT IS RADICAL. BUT I STUDIED IT OUT. I'VE, I've WAITED YEARS. BUT NOW I'VE HEARD OTHER PEOPLE TEACH THIS. I'VE HEARD TWO OR THREE OTHER PEOPLE THAT TEACH THIS SAME THING. SO I'M CERTAINLY NOT SAYING THAT I'M THE ONLY ONE WHO'S TEACHING THIS, BUT I'M SAYING IT'S SELDOM THAT PEOPLE TEACH THIS. MOST PEOPLE TEACH THAT EVERY TIME YOU SIN, IT IS A NEW TRANSGRESSION BETWEEN YOU AND GOD AND YOU'VE GOT TO GET IT CONFESSED AND DEALT WITH OR GOD WON'T FELLOWSHIP WITH YOU OR THE EXTREME. HE WON'T EVEN... You, YOU'VE LOST YOUR SALVATION IF YOU'VE GOT AN UNCONFESSED SIN IN YOUR LIFE. BUT THIS SAYS THAT JESUS ENTERED IN ONCE 
into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption, not momentary redemption, eternal redemption. And then in verse 15, it says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. There's a large segment of the body of Christ that think that every time you sin, you lose your salvation, you're backslid, and you got to get born again again. They don't believe that you have eternal redemption and eternal inheritance. It's momentary, and it's all based on your performance. You know, again, I said this, but if, if I really believe that your performance was necessary for you to retain your salvation, once you get born again, if you ever sin, and if you don't get that sin confessed, that you would die and go to hell, then I would just kill you because that's the only way you would ever be able to maintain that salvation. If it was dependent upon you having every single sin confessed, it would be impossible for you to retain that salvation. Did you know when you came to the Lord, you didn't have to confess every sin? Some people say that. They say that you need to come and you need to confess your sins and ask God to forgive you. That's not what the Bible teaches. Matter of fact, let me just turn over and read this out of the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. This is where Paul and Silas were in jail, and at midnight they began to sing and worship God. God sent an earthquake, and all of the prisoners' cells were open. All of their chains fell off. And uh, in those days, if your prisoners escaped, well, then the Romans would kill the jailer. jailer. Uh, for, for that. And so Paul knew that this jailer was going to suppose that all of the prisoners had escaped. And so he cried out with a loud voice and told the uh, jailer not to kill himself, that they were all there. And so in, this is Acts chapter 16, verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what did Paul answer? He didn't say, well, confess your sins and ask God to forgive you. See, that's what a lot of Christians say, but that's not what he said. He said unto them, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. He didn't tell them to confess their sins. You know, if you believe that you have to confess your sins in order to get saved, what happens if you forget one? Does that mean that it wasn't covered, that you aren't saved? I do believe that you have to acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you need a Savior. If you don't think that somehow or another, if you think that you're better than other people and that somehow or another you don't really need very much forgiveness, I don't think that you can be born again like that. Jesus doesn't just add to your righteousness and make up the difference. No, you have to put faith in Him. So I do believe you have to acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you need salvation, but you don't have to confess your sins because, you, for one thing, you can't even acknowledge all of your sins. I've, said, I've made this point on previous programs, but it bears repeating because most people don't believe this. But the Scripture says in James chapter 4, verse 17, "...to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin." So did you know that most of us recognize that we need to love our mate more than what we do? That sometimes we get caught up in selfishness, and it may not be malicious, but we aren't. You know, the Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 5 that husbands are supposed to love their wife the way that Christ loves the church. Is there anybody who is so deceived that you think you love your wife as much as Christ loved the church? We might be loving them more than we ever have. We might be doing better than we've ever done. We might be doing better than somebody else, but I guarantee you there's none of us that have loved our mate as much as Christ loved the church. And the, and the Scripture also says in Ephesians chapter 5 that the wife is supposed to reverence her husband the way that the church reverences Christ. Are there any women that think that you reverence your husband as much as the church is supposed to reverence Christ? You might be doing better than other people, but no, nobody's perfect. So if you use the definition that the Bible gives of sin, to him that knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin, then all of us constantly sin. You just can't live on this 
YOU CAN'T LIVE THIS MINDSET THAT RELIGION IS PUT DOWN THAT YOU GOT TO GET EVERY SIN CONFESSED AND UNDER THE BLOOD AND EVERY TIME YOU SIN, YOU GOT TO REPENT. EVERY TIME YOU SIN, YOU LOSE SOME OF YOUR BENEFITS OF SALVATION AND UNTIL YOU REPENT OF THAT AND GET BACK IN RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD THAT YOU CAN'T EXPECT YOUR PRAYERS TO BE ANSWERED. YOU CAN'T EXPECT GOD TO USE YOU OR THOSE KIND OF THINGS. YOU CAN'T LIVE THAT WAY. YOU KNOW, I TRIED TO LIVE THAT WAY. THAT'S THE WAY THAT BASICALLY I WAS RAISED UP. AND WHEN THE LORD CALLED ME INTO THE MINISTRY, I ACTUALLY MADE A PROMISE TO GOD THAT I'D FAST TWO WEEKS BEFORE EVERY SINGLE TIME I MINISTERED. <laughs> DID YOU KNOW IF I WAS TRYING TO LIVE THAT NOW, I'D BE DEAD BY NOW. I, I, I MINISTER, uh, I'LL BE MAKING 10 TELEVISION PROGRAMS IN ONE DAY TODAY. Uh, I MINISTER uh, USUALLY SOMEWHERE AROUND 20 OR MORE TIMES PER WEEK. IF I HAD TO FAST TWO WEEKS BEFORE EVERY SINGLE TIME I MINISTER, I'D BE PLUMB GONE BY NOW. BUT SEE WHAT I WAS DOING? I WAS TRYING TO EARN GOD'S FAVOR. I WAS TRYING TO DO SOMETHING AND SAY, GOD, AM I GOOD ENOUGH? NOW WILL YOU USE ME? YOU KNOW, I HAD AN INSTANCE IN um, Pritchett, COLORADO. I WENT THERE TO PASTOR A CHURCH, AND WE SAW A MAN RAISED FROM THE DEAD. AND IT WAS QUITE AN EXPERIENCE. I MEAN, THE SHERIFF WAS THERE TRYING TO GET HIS DEFIBRILLATOR GOING AND STUFF, AND WHILE HE WAS FUMBLING AROUND, I JUST WALKED IN AND COMMANDED THIS MAN TO COME BACK IN THE NAME OF JESUS, AND HE JUST SAT UP AND STARTED TALKING. AND IT CAUSED NO SMALL STIR. AND SO WE HAD 144 PEOPLE IN THIS TOWN OF Pritchett, COLORADO, AND 100 STARTED COMING TO CHURCH. THEY WERE COMING FROM 20, 30, 40 MILES AWAY. AND WE STARTED SEEING THINGS HAPPEN, AND I GOT SO BUSY THAT I HAD NO TIME TO STUDY THE WORD OR TO PRAY, AND I WAS STILL, I HAD RECEIVED A LOT OF FREEDOM IN THE AREA OF UNDERSTANDING GRACE, BUT I WAS STILL THINKING, GOD, I'VE GOT TO DO BETTER THAN THIS. I'VE GOT TO LIVE HOLY. HOW COULD YOU EVER USE ME IF I'M NOT STUDYING THE WORD AND DOING THINGS? AND I WAS LITERALLY SO BUSY THAT I MEAN FROM MORNING UNTIL NIGHT, PEOPLE WERE COMING BY, AND I WAS PRAYING, BUT I WAS PRAYING OVER PEOPLE. I WAS OPENING UP THE BIBLE, BUT IT WAS TO SHOW PEOPLE SCRIPTURES. AND I LITERALLY WENT DAYS AT A TIME WITHOUT READING THE BIBLE FOR MYSELF OR PRAYING FOR MYSELF. I WAS PRAYING AND READING FOR OTHER PEOPLE. AND I MEAN, I WAS MINISTERING 12, 15 HOURS A DAY TO PEOPLE. SO ONE DAY I JUST MADE A DECISION THAT I WAS GOING TO FAST AND PRAY ALL DAY LONG THE NEXT DAY. I COMMITTED THAT DAY TO FASTING AND PRAYING. And so. I ACTUALLY HAD SOMEBODY COME WAKE ME UP AT LIKE 5 O'CLOCK IN THE MORNING AND THEY NEEDED PRAYER. SO I STARTED MINISTERING TO PEOPLE EARLY IN THE MORNING. AND uh, SO I WAS PRAYING, BUT I WASN'T PRAYING PERSONALLY IN MY RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD. I WAS PRAYING FOR OTHER PEOPLE. AT LUNCH, I HAD A GUY COME BY WHO I'D BEEN WITNESSING TO. AND THIS GUY WASN'T A BELIEVER, BUT HE, he CAME AND ASKED IF HE COULD TAKE ME OUT TO EAT. AND I THOUGHT, OH, MAN, THIS COULD BE THE DAY THAT THIS GUY GETS BORN AGAIN. I CAN'T TELL HIM I'M FASTING AND NOT EAT AND LET HIM GO TO HELL JUST BECAUSE I'M FASTING. SO I WENT OUT WITH HIM. AND BECAUSE I DIDN'T EAT ANY BREAKFAST, I WAS HUNGRY, AND I ate TWICE AS MUCH <laughs> AT LUNCH AS WHAT I NORMALLY WOULD HAVE DONE. AND SO ANYWAY, TOWARDS THE EVENING, I WAS DRIVING 45 MILES TO A BIBLE STUDY TO CONDUCT A BIBLE STUDY. AND ON THE WAY OVER THERE, I WAS JUST FEELING LIKE, GOD, HOW COULD YOU EVER USE ME? I PROMISED YOU I'D FAST, I'D PRAY. I ATE TWICE AS MUCH AS I NORMALLY DID. I'VE BEEN PRAYING FOR OTHER PEOPLE, BUT I HADN'T BEEN FELLOWSHIPPING WITH YOU, AND I JUST WAS FEELING SO UNWORTHY AND THINKING, OH, GOD, HOW COULD YOU EVER USE ME? AND SO AS I WAS DRIVING TO THIS BIBLE STUDY, I WAS SAYING, OH, GOD, I KNOW THAT I FAILED YOU, BUT WHAT ABOUT THE PEOPLE? GO AHEAD AND USE ME AND SPEAK THROUGH ME AND TOUCH PEOPLE JUST BECAUSE YOU LOVE THE PEOPLE. And I didn't feel any great surge of faith after praying that, so I just kept bartering with God and saying, oh, but God, what about the people? What about this? And finally, I said, what about Jesus? Just do it because of who Jesus is. And as soon as I said that, the Lord spoke to me and He said, who did you think I was going to do it because of? <laughs> and I found out that I had fallen back into this thing of thinking, God, you're going to use me because I fast, because I pray, because I do these things. Now, again, fasting and praying and all of these things, studying the Word, these things are important, but you don't do it to impress God. You do it to impress yourself with how awesome God is. Fasting doesn't give you any extra pull with God. What it does, it focuses your attention more on God. 
IT'S NOT JUST GOING WITHOUT FOOD, BUT IT'S SUBSTITUTING THAT TIME THAT YOU WOULD HAVE BEEN EATING FOOD AND YOU ARE USING THAT TO FOCUS YOUR ATTENTION UPON GOD. FASTING CHANGES YOUR HEART TOWARDS GOD. IT DOESN'T CHANGE GOD'S HEART TOWARDS YOU. STUDYING THE WORD AND PRAYING AND DOING THINGS LIKE THIS CHANGES YOUR HEART TOWARDS GOD, BUT IT DOESN'T MAKE GOD LOVE YOU ANY MORE. SEE, I HAD FALLEN BACK INTO THINKING THAT GOD WAS GOING TO USE ME BASED ON SOME PERFORMANCE. AND WHEN YOU ARE SITTING HERE THINKING THAT YOU'VE GOT TO HAVE EVERY SIN THAT YOU COMMIT CONFESSED AND UNDER THE BLOOD, AND UNTIL YOU DO, GOD WON'T USE YOU. YOU ARE IN A PERFORMANCE-BASED RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD. YOU'RE LIVING, IN A SENSE, UNDER THE OLD COVENANT WHERE EVERY SIN'S GOT TO BE COVERED. UNDER THE NEW COVENANT, THESE ARE THE VERSES THAT I'VE BEEN USING THAT JESUS ENTERED IN ONE TIME AND OBTAINED ETERNAL REDEMPTION FOR YOU AND ETERNAL INHERITANCE. YOU DON'T LOSE YOUR RIGHT STANDING WITH GOD. YOUR RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD DOESN'T FLUCTUATE BASED ON YOUR PERFORMANCE. IF IT DID, NONE OF US WOULD EVER BE USED OF GOD. GOD HAS NEVER HAD ANYBODY QUALIFIED WORKING FOR HIM YET, AND YOU AREN'T GOING TO BE THE FIRST ONE. YOU'VE GOT TO COME TO A PLACE TO WHERE YOU RECOGNIZE IT'S ALL JESUS. SEE, THE OLD COVENANT, it was, IT WAS CONSTANTLY IN FLUX. IT WAS ALWAYS UP AND DOWN BASED ON YOUR PERFORMANCE. HAVE YOU OFFERED THE RIGHT SACRIFICE? HAVE YOU DONE ALL OF THESE THINGS? BUT UNDER THE NEW COVENANT, IT'S DIFFERENT. I READ THESE VERSES A COUPLE OF DAYS AGO, BUT HEBREWS CHAPTER 8, VERSE 12, PART OF THAT NEW COVENANT SAYS, I WILL BE MERCIFUL TO THEIR UNRIGHTEOUSNESS AND THEIR SINS AND THEIR INIQUITIES WILL I REMEMBER NO MORE. AND IN THIS NINTH CHAPTER, IT SAYS, BUT THERE IS A REMEMBRANCE AGAIN of, OF SINS EVERY SINGLE YEAR. UNDER THE OLD COVENANT, YOU NEVER GOT FREE FROM SIN. YOU JUST GOT THEM ATONED FOR, COVERED, BUT NEVER ANNIHILATED, DONE AWAY WITH. UNDER THE NEW COVENANT, YOUR SINS, PAST, PRESENT, AND EVEN THE ONES YOU HAVEN'T COMMITTED YET, HAVE ALL BEEN ATONED FOR. YOU DO NOT LOSE YOUR RIGHT STANDING WITH GOD WHEN YOU SIN. NOW, AGAIN, IF THERE'S SOMEBODY WATCHING THIS PROGRAM WHO HAS NEVER MADE JESUS YOUR LORD, THIS DOESN'T APPLY TO YOU. THE ENTRANCE INTO THIS TYPE OF RELATIONSHIP THAT I'M TALKING ABOUT ALL COMES THROUGH YOU MAKING JESUS CHRIST YOUR PERSONAL LORD AND SAVIOR. IF YOU'VE NEVER DONE THAT, THEN THERE IS A REMEMBRANCE OF YOUR SINS. THOSE SINS DO SEPARATE YOU FROM GOD. BUT FOR THOSE WHO RECEIVE THE SALVATION THAT JESUS OFFERS, YOUR SINS WERE DEALT WITH PAST, PRESENT, AND FUTURE. JESUS DEALT WITH SIN ONE TIME, ONCE FOR ALL. THAT IS ABSOLUTELY AMAZING. AND PEOPLE THINK, HOW CAN GOD FORGIVE A SIN BEFORE I EVEN COMMIT IT? WELL, YOU BETTER PRAY THAT HE CAN BECAUSE HE ONLY DIED FOR YOUR SINS ONE TIME 2,000 YEARS AGO BEFORE YOU'D EVER COMMITTED ANY. IF GOD CAN'T FORGIVE A SIN BEFORE YOU COMMIT IT, WELL, THEN YOU CAN'T BE FORGIVEN BECAUSE YOU SINNED AFTER JESUS DIED FOR THE SINS OF THE WORLD. SO HE'S DEALT WITH ALL OF OUR SINS. AND THE NEXT FEW VERSES IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 9 TALK ABOUT IT'S THE BLOOD THAT MADE AN ATONEMENT FOR SIN. AND IT TALKS ABOUT UNDER THE OLD COVENANT THAT BLOOD HAD TO BE SHED EVERY TIME THAT THERE WAS A SIN. AND IN VERSE um, 22, IT SAYS, AND ALMOST ALL THINGS ARE BY THE LAW PURGED WITH BLOOD, AND WITHOUT THE SHEDDING OF BLOOD THERE IS NO REMISSION. IF JESUS HAD NOT DIED AND SHED HIS BLOOD FOR THE REMISSION OF OUR SINS, THERE COULD HAVE BEEN NO FORGIVENESS. BUT JESUS DID DIE, AND BECAUSE OF THAT, HE DEALT WITH OUR SINS ONCE FOR ALL. IT GOES ON TO SAY IN VERSE 23, IT SAYS, IT WAS THEREFORE NECESSARY THAT THE PATTERNS OF THINGS IN HEAVEN SHOULD BE PURIFIED WITH THESE, BUT THE HEAVENLY THINGS THEMSELVES WITH BETTER SACRIFICES THAN THESE. TALKING ABOUT THAT THE OLD TESTAMENT SACRIFICE OF ANIMALS WAS NECESSARY FOR THE TIME, BUT WE'VE GOT SOMETHING BETTER THAN THAT, BETTER THAN THE BLOOD OF ANIMALS. WE'VE GOT THE BLOOD OF THE LORD JESUS CHRIST THAT WAS SHED FOR OUR SINS. IN VERSE 24, IT SAYS, FOR CHRIST IS NOT ENTERED INTO THE HOLY PLACES MADE WITH HANDS, WHICH ARE THE FIGURES OF THE TRUE, BUT INTO HEAVEN ITSELF, NOW TO APPEAR IN THE PRESENCE OF GOD FOR US. AND IN VERSE 25, NOR YET THAT HE SHOULD OFFER HIMSELF OFTEN, AS THE HIGH PRIEST ENTERETH INTO THE HOLY PLACE EVERY YEAR WITH BLOOD OF OTHERS. AGAIN, THIS IS EMPHASIZING THAT JESUS DEALT WITH OUR SINS ONCE FOR ALL TIME. 
He dealt with all of it. He doesn't have to go in every year as the high priest did because all he had was the symbolic blood of an animal. But Jesus literally entered into the true temple in heaven, into the true Holy of Holies with his own blood, and he only had to do it one time. So again, in verse 25, "...nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself." So this is the fourth time, and there's another time that this is going to be mentioned before this chapter is over. But here's four times already that it's emphasizing that Jesus dealt with sin once for all time. You are not just forgiven momentarily until the next time you sin. You are forgiven of all of your sin, past, present, and even the sins that you haven't committed. He goes on to say in verse 27, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Five times in this one chapter, as he's trying to make the difference between the old covenant way of relating to God and the new covenant, he, he mentions that in the old covenant, they had to offer sacrifices over and over and over and over. There was a continual remembrance of sin. But in contrast to that, under the new covenant, we now have one sacrifice of Jesus for all of our sins for all time, and sin has been removed, even the ones we haven't committed yet. I know that this raises a question. Some people are saying, so are you saying that you can just go live in sin? No, that's not what I'm saying. I don't have time today to explain this anymore, but no, that's not what I'm saying. Sin is still deadly, but not from God's standpoint. He's not holding it against you. He's forgiven all of your sins, but sin still opens up a door to the devil, and you do not want to give Satan an inroad into your life. He only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. If you go live in sin, he's going to eat your lunch and pop the bag, but God still loves you.